an audience with the supreme goddess. The Palace of Tanjay, situated about 50 miles from Kalnagur, was the Metropolitan Palace of the Supreme Goddess. It was sculptured out of a hill of white marble, as were also its walls, enclosing a garden a square mile in extent. In conformity with the programme prepared by His Majesty King Almeri Bulmakar, we were to be received by Her Holiness Leone in her palace at Tanjay. The thought of meeting the adorable figure that crowned the throne of the gods filled me with the keenest delight. I seemed about to visit not a human being like myself, but a veritable deity. What honour, what pleasure it would be to speak to her face to face, heart to heart. Disguise it as I might, a feeling for the goddess was being awakened in my soul. Was it the adoration of the worshipper, or was it the dawn of a sacrilegious passion? It seemed a monstrous idea for anyone to love in the ordinary meaning of the term a being so high and holy. I could only worship her afar off, like any adoring citizen of Atvatabar. His Majesty the King, together with Chief Minister Koshnili, Commander-in-Chief Coltonbury, Admiral Jolnar and other dignitaries of the kingdom, did us the honour to escort us to Tanjay. The method of travel between Kalnagor and Tanjay was by means of the pneumatic tube, also a deity of invention. This consisted of a smooth tube six feet in diameter that curved over the country in a sinuous line, being supported on pillars at a height of 20 feet above the ground. A decorative car of gold, ornamented in enamelled colours, rode the crest of the tube, being connected with the piston inside. The car was steadied between the rails on either side, and swept over the earth with inconceivable rapidity. The distance from Kalnagur to Tanjay was traversed in thirty minutes. A feeling of awe overcame the sailors as we approached the abode of the living symbol of the Holy Soul. The palace was a noble pile of masonry as it glittered in the perpendicular sunlight. It stood two storeys in height and was surmounted by a flattened central dome of coloured glass, the ribs of the dome being of solid gold. The lower storey was surrounded by a colonnade of pillars, carved in the most grotesque shapes imaginable. The grand entrance on the north side was constructed of alternating pillars of platinum and gold, all three feet in thickness. From the towers, brilliant banners emblazoned with the figure of the throne of the gods floated on the wind. The apartments of the Grand Chamberlain were on the north side of the palace, where the pneumatic car was provided with a depot for the use of travellers. Cleparellium, the Grand Chamberlain, clad in white robes like an Arab chief, received us in the name of the goddess with marked deference and courtesy. A guard of honour consisting of a thousand whaleals was drawn up around the palace. The audience chamber was a rectangular court in the centre of the building, whose ceiling was the roof of the palace itself surmounted by the dome peculiar to the palaces of Atvatabar. The hall leading to the presence chamber was lined with the priests and priestesses from Egyplosis in attendance on the goddess. Led by the Grand Chamberlain, we arrived at the golden doors of the audience chamber, which were opened by the servitors of the palace. With trembling exultation, I saw at the further end of the spacious apartment a royal seat of violet velvet, whereupon sat Leone, the supreme goddess of Atvatabar. As my eyes rested upon the goddess, she appeared still more divine than before. It seemed an unhallowed act that rough sailors should venture into such spiritual precincts. We were awestruck with the presence before us. As the Grand Chamberlain called out our names, we bowed low to that majestic spirit that seemed so much more deity than human flesh. Her Holiness greeted us with marked favour and offered both His Majesty the King and myself her hand to kiss. The high officials and my officers and sailors were obliged to remain standing during the audience, according to the etiquette of the Holy Palace. His Majesty the King and myself were allowed to seat ourselves on an elevated dais before the goddess. When thus seated, I had leisure to observe that she was arrayed in a single garment of quivering pale green silk that caressed every curve of her matchless figure and spread in myriad folds about her limbs and feet. On her head she wore a model of the jarkal, or bird of yearning, fashioned in precious terellium. She wore also a jewelled belt of gold. The breast was embroidered with a golden emblem of the throne of the gods, the sacred ensign of Atvatabar. On her neck were circles of rich rose pearls, whose light gleamed soft on the green lustre of her attire. On her head was the tiara of the goddess, the triple crown of Harakar. Her holiness had an air of girlish frankness combined with royal dignity. She was so youthful that she could not have been more than twenty years old. She possessed a charming presence and a clear musical voice. Her eyes were large and blue, and her finely formed lips, like blood-red anemones, contrasted finely with the pale gold hue of her complexion. 
Her features combined the witchery of a horai with the strength of intellect. They were sculptured and illuminated by a grandly developed soul. The odour of a high, steadfast virtue surrounded her. It was not the virtue of the ascetic, but rather that strength of soul that could triumph over temptation, that loved fair lights, fine raiment, sweet colours, and all the gladness and beauty of life. In her soft right hand she bore a rod of divination, the spiritual sceptre of Atvatbar. On either side of her stood a twin soul in fond embrace as a guard of love. The audience chamber was in itself a dream of grandeur and beauty. From the rose-tinted glass of the dome overhead, a light soft and warm bathed all beneath with a peculiar sweetness. The lower part of the walls resembled the cloisters of a mosque. Behind pillars of solid silver, a corridor ran all around the chamber. Here, an artistic group of singers, clad in classic robes in soft colours, perambulated, singing as they went a refrain of penetrating sweetness. The audience listened with the deepest respect to the singing and to our conversation with the goddess. In the assembly were all the notables of the kingdom, poets, artists, musicians, inventors, sculptors, etc., as well as royal and sacerdotal officers. The singing of the choir, that moved like an apparition of spirits in the dim cloisters, seemed to embody our thoughts and feelings. For myself, the divine song was a draught of joy. It was a breath of verdure, of flowers and fruits, of a warm and serene atmosphere made perfect by the presence of a peerless incarnation of man's eternal universal soul. End of chapter 21